Welcome to the Quillette Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Kay, a senior editor at Quillette. Quillette is where free thought lives. We are an independent, grassroots platform for heterodox ideas and fearless commentary. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by going to quillette.com and becoming a paid subscriber. The subscription will also give you access to all our articles and early access to Quillette social events. Welcome to the Quillette Podcast. I'm Jonathan Kay. What we just heard is a segment of the famous restaurant sketch from the TV comedy series Portlandia, which ran from 2011 to 2018. And for many of us outside Portland, this is what shaped our impression of the once obscure Oregon City, a hub for affable, if somewhat pretentious, knowledge workers and hipsters. In recent years, however, Portland has become known for something else, having become a battleground for political radicals who have destroyed federal property, terrorized businesses, and in one notorious case involving Antifa, beaten a journalist in broad daylight. For this week's podcast, we have two former longtime Portland residents, Nancy Rommelman and Michael Totten, who've both written in detail for Quillette about the reasons why they left a city they once loved. In the process, we get into the unique history of Portland, from its creation by Easterners arriving in covered wagons to its downward spiraling amid the current pandemic, which kept office workers at home in the suburbs, thereby surrendering the downtown to violent mobs of disaffected youth. Michael Totten, who still lives elsewhere in Oregon, is an American journalist and book author who's reported from around the world. Nancy Rommelman is a New York native who's returned to that city after many years in Los Angeles and then Portland, where she and her husband ran a well-known Portland coffee house operation called Ristretto Roasters, which, as some Quillette readers may remember, became the subject of a furious social justice mobbing in 2019. I spoke to Michael and Nancy by Skype this past Wednesday. Here are excerpts from our conversation. Michael, one thing I learned from reading your article was that Portland came very close to being called Boston. Yeah, so Portland was founded by New Englanders who came over on covered wagons. And, well, actually, I should say Oregon City was originally founded by New Englanders who came on covered wagons. That was the end of the Oregon Trail. Oregon City is the oldest city in the state of Oregon. It's actually the oldest city west of the Rocky Mountains. And Portland was built later. And some prominent New Englanders got in an argument about what the city should be called. One of them wanted to name it after his hometown in Maine, Portland, and the other wanted to name it after Boston, Massachusetts, it was his, his hometown. So they had a coin toss, and um, Portland won two out of three coin tosses. So the United States has two Portlands instead of two Bostons, which is probably better than having two Bostons, because Portland, Oregon, and Boston, Massachusetts are both similar size cities, whereas Portland, Maine is kind of a rinky-dink little place. So if somebody says Portland, it's just assumed in the United States you're talking about Portland, Oregon, rather than Maine, unless you're, like, in Maine. The unique character of that of that area of the Pacific Northwest was created out of, as you describe it, a kind of like big government, but also puritanical New England type viewpoint. But then you also had more working class Appalachian laborers who came in. And you make the case that the unique character in that part of the Pacific Northwest comes out of those two groups. And, and maybe that is correct. Could you kind of draw the line that gets us from, you know, these two guys in, in beaver tail hats, as I imagine them, having this coin, coin toss and then like a bunch of people in balaclavas running around smashing up Starbucks? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting it's an interesting history here. And actually, it's rather obscure. Most people here don't know this. And I didn't even know it myself until recently uh, when I read a book called American Nations by, oh gosh, I forget the guy's name. Uh, the book's called American Nations. He describes the founding, for lack of a better word, of each region of the United States and the local baseline culture in each place. Like New England is a very different culture than like the Deep South. So he just goes into the history of all these different places. And Appalachia has, which is also part of the South, is a very distinct place from, um, from the Deep South. Appalachia is basically very libertarian. And if you want to really simplify it, it's a libertarian anti-government place. And New England is has um, al- has always been somewhat utopian, the, the whole city on a hill idea. And in the Pacific Northwest, it was founded by most of the people who came here on on the Oregon Trail 
were uh, the elite came from New England and the working class came from Appalachia. So there's an interesting hybrid culture here that's distinct and unique in the United States where there's this elite utopianism that combines with um, working class libertarianism. And so I can't prove that the, that the riots in Portland and Seattle are based on this. But if you if you look at these people who are smashing Starbucks windows and whatnot, their ideology is very utopian. They're not like liberal reformers who are protesting to have like the police department reformed. Right. They want to abolish the police. They want to abolish the prisons. Some of their graffiti, they're talking about giving all the land back to Native Americans. They're obviously extremely utopian, but they're also, well, they're anarchists. They're not socialists. They're not communists. They're anarchists. They're completely, radically anti-government. It's like they took the worst utopianism from New England and wedded it to the worst anti-government extremism from Appalachia. There's nowhere else in the country that combines these two things at scale. Now, the average person who lives here is not like a utopian anti-government person. This is obviously a very small minority. The baseline culture in the Pacific Northwest blends utopianism and libertarianism in a more positive way than, than, than anarchism, for sure. We're going to get back to that because you have an interesting line in your Quillette article. I think at one point you said there's, there's basically like 200 anarchists in Portland, and they've managed to ruin it for a lot of the rest of the people. But I want to bring Nancy into the conversation because Nancy, unlike Michael, you're not rooted in just solely in that part of the country. No, no. I, I was born in Manhattan, raised in Brooklyn, lived in L.A. for 15 years, and then in Portland for 14 years. I actually uh, left at late 2019, and I now live back in New York City. I'm speaking to you from Chinatown. Yes, I, I um, the whole sort of ethos of Portland and the way people behave when I got up there, it was very strange to me. People were, first of all, super friendly, which was nice, but also, at least when I got there in 2004, very much of, you know, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything at all. Like they didn't, they didn't want you to get too excited and they didn't want you. I mean, I think that's changed. Obviously we see uh, overexcitement in the streets every night in Portland, pretty much. They get it, very excited. as I Very say, excited yeah, yeah, yeah. in air quotes. But what, yes, what, what Michael is describing in terms of, you know, the sort of utopian dreams that are completely unfeasible. Um, yes, you're seeing that now, but in terms of the sort of character of Portland, yeah, it wasn't exactly that sort of, you know, independent, looking toward the Western sky kind of Westerner. It, it does have a bit of that sort of like Puritanism, I think. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Does, yes. Does, yes. But, but also uh, Oregon, just as a whole, is a very nice place. I mean, people are just very friendly and they go along to get along. And that's just that's just how it's always it's always been here, which is yeah. very different, Nancy, than from where you're from. It's just a very different <laughs> where you're from. Hey. I, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we all know what New York is. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I like New York's bluntness, personally, because I'm kind of a blunt person. Uh, that is one thing I remember in L.A., where I lived for a long time, no one wants to tell you no, which is which slows things down terribly. Yeah. It's like, yes. in New York, it's like, no, you can't have that. Am I dry cleaning it? No, you can't have it. It's like, oh, okay. And, you know, people are not afraid to just tell you what they think. I find New York to be very friendly and helpful, but, you know. Toronto has its own very, like, genteel, waspy thing which wastes a lot of time. One of the reasons I, I like some of the immigrant-run stores here in Toronto, the immigrant-run stores, I think there's one near me that says, no mask, no enter, go away. I, 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 <laughs> you know, like, it doesn't. No time wasted. It's like, oh, I think I'll put on my mask then. But, but what's interesting about this, when one thinks of the tribalism that's now in the United States... It tends to be there's rural Republican voters and there's urbanites who vote Democrat and drink expensive kinds of coffee, like the kind that Nancy used to make when she lived yeah. in My Portland. Um, <laughs> Rosetto Roasters, uh, which is the whole... That's the best coffee, by the way, Nancy. Yeah. I still not had found coffee. It's, yeah. it's no more. There yeah. is no more until, Roasters. Until it became poisoned by social injustice. <laughs> We're not going to get into yeah, that. Thanks, Nancy. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Me and my big mouth, right? right? Yeah. Thanks for ruining coffee for everyone. But what I was saying is that to the average person it's like rural versus urban but of course that's simplified and every city has its own culture and history brooklyn itself has dozens of neighborhoods and some of them may look and feel superficially very much like portland neighborhoods yeah um, totally. and yet what you're telling me is that you can't just look at 
the architecture and the demography and the income data, there are values that are embedded in, in the civic culture, which in this case led to some pretty terrible stuff, including, I mean, you almost weren't able to sell your house, although you said in your article it worked out. I mean, you did sell it, right? It took, what, about two months to sell the house, which is normal in a normal real estate market. But it's such an abnormal real estate market here because houses in the suburbs are selling in sometimes within hours. I mean, my realtor told me that there are houses that are getting 50 offers in one day. My house, it took two months to sell it, and we had an open house and two people showed up. Because, because my old house before I left the city was within like walking distance of downtown. And downtown turned into a dystopian nightmare. But Because you, you draw a straight line between the pandemic and also then the violence. A couple of years ago, it was like walk to downtown was a huge draw. Yeah, uh, totally. And, th and then it was like walk to downtown, gross. Yeah. All these high paid knowledge workers making a lot of money, commuting from the suburbs every day. And then as soon as they were removed from the equation, does something like that happen in Brooklyn? I had a very, if I, I'm just going to backtrack for one second. My house, it was on the market too last year. We put it on the market. We were about to actually just rent it out for a year. And then the they, they changed the renter's laws to make it all in favor of the renter and not in favor of the owner at all. And we just decided we couldn't, we couldn't take that chance. And thank God we didn't because then COVID hit. We put it on the market and then there were the riots. And I was even closer to downtown than Michael was. Like I was right by the water, two minutes from downtown over the bridge. And it was a really nice neighborhood, but we too had to drop the, drop the price. We just needed to get out. But as to your question, I really was in Portland. I was in Portland for four months last year, you know, two months for reason doing reporting on the ground or maybe not two, maybe like six weeks. And then I got kind of pandemic stuck there from March through May. So I didn't really see... A lot of stuff in Brooklyn. However, my daughter, when I was in Portland, she lives right in Fort Greene in Brooklyn, and it was right on her block. I mean, serious violence and crowds. And she took a picture. She was actually in her apartment. She's like, this is happening like right, right on my street. The thing about New York City is that, yes, you'll have you'll have like, you know, the peaceful protests and then you will have, you know, the yahoos that come out and they bust stuff up. But it's a big city with lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of people, different kinds of people. So these things don't really dominate the narrative the way that it did in Portland and was allowed to continue to dominate the narrative between a combination of the temperament and what people wanted to do and ineptitude in the government. And, and then, you know, it was in the eye of the media and the media made a big deal out of this. Portland was very, very, very anti-Trump, as Michael talks about in his piece, and as I quoted Michael in my piece. And so the media sort of kept an eye on Portland, which kept it, I think, in some ways going. I, I put in my piece, you know, Portland hadn't really been number one in anything since the Trailblazers won the championship in 1977. And here they were every single night. Everybody wanted to talk to them. And it really became sort of an identity, whereas in New York... There's too many other kinds of identities. Like you are not going to dominate the stage. Like practically no one can dominate the stage because there's too many there's too many hot things at one time. Yeah, that's an interesting point because Portland is significantly smaller than New York. I mean, the metro area is 2.5 million people. The city itself is something like 700,000 people. There's this weird subplot. I didn't even realize it, Michael, until I read your article. Ted Wheeler at one point was probably the most famous mayor in the United States because... Yeah. Under Portland's weird system, he was also the police commissioner. And if you read the right-wing press, he was this Maoist and was encouraging the attacks. But then on the left, he was seen as his mother was dying and they were trying to trash his condo, if I remember correctly. I mean, it was just, it was, it was horrible. Yeah, the, the far left saw him as a fascist and the far right saw him as an anarchist. And he's really, he's just kind of, a, he's a conventional Democrat by ideology. Not a strong leader, let's put it that way. When you have a leader people don't like it tends to attract strong contenders to come in to take his place because they sense an opening. In New York, you've got you know Andrew Yang, who actually I thought would make a pretty good president, and he, he's trying to become mayor of New York. And <laughs> in Portland, and I want you to explain this to me, his opponent was someone named Sarah Iana Roney. Is that how you pronounce her name? Yeah, Iana Roney. And, and her campaign, well, one plank was, I am Antifa. She yeah. al she also yeah. I mean she yeah. she said that on Twitter. I know that it was a plank exactly. Oh well, okay. So here's here's something else. I mean, this is something you would think Tucker Carlson would make up or put up as a graphic on a show, but she went <laughs> to public <laughs> right. wearing a dress 
festooned with the faces of mass murdering tyrants. How did this happen? Actually, what a surprise. I, she I, lost. I, I actually don't think it was during campaign season because that was the big thing. It's like, oh, my God, she's got a she's got a skirt with like Mao and and Stalin. How was this person the main contender for mayor of a large American city? Because, OK, so here's how this works. So there was a primary. And if if one person doesn't win 50 percent plus one of the vote, then there's a runoff between the top two vote getters. And in the primary, there was something like 20 people ran. And Ted Wheeler, who was the incumbent, he won by far the largest share in the primary. And Sarah Iannarone came in second, but she was second out of a field of like 20 people. So when you got 20 people running, you can get any kind of lunatic could come in second place. You could get a communist, you could get a Nazi, you can get God knows what when there's that much competition. Like regular people disperse their votes across a gigantic field. So that's how she ended up being his challenger. And also, John, you know, it, she, there, at one point, it actually didn't look like she was going to lose. She was actually shown to be ahead for a little while, but there was a... There was a third party write in candidate who bled off, if I'm not mistaken, That's 12 true. points. Yeah, and right. but, you know, he I, I interviewed an attorney for a piece I was writing for Reason and, and I was talking about the mayoral election. And and someone said this lawyer said to me, well, the one thing that Sarah Iana Roan has going for her is that she's not Ted Wheeler. Yep. You know, <laughs> so yeah, Wheeler was not popular, but I, I really felt and, and told people so that he was going to win again, because even though you have the sort of loud activists shouting and making lots of noise, it's like, it's like a, it's like a big bird that flaps its wings to make it look itself look bigger than it is. Portland is in the main pretty middle class. And even though they don't like Ted Wheeler, they are not going to be like, oh, sure, cool. We're just going to go for the pro-Antifa candidate. And actually, she was very openly pro-Antifa. It wasn't like a little throwaway thing. Right. Uh, she was, um, she she said it many times. Um, she defended certain things and certain things that she wanted to abolish within the government or the police. And she was definitely, you know, the, the, the activists are obviously there. They want to live in a, in, a, in a world where there's no government. They just want to overthrow pretty much everything. And yet a lot of them were pretty hyped about her because, and I wonder if it's because like, well, if she gets in there, we can like get our way, whatever our way is. I, I've yet to see the things that they want to build. I only see the things that they want to destroy. If you're a regular listener to the Quillette podcast, you'll be familiar with BetterHelp, one of our original advertisers. Well, thanks to everything that's happened since early 2020 and the stresses that the pandemic has put on everyone, the online therapy services at BetterHelp are more relevant and in demand than ever. BetterHelp will help you unlock the tools you need to help with motivation, depression, anxiety, battling your temper, stress, dealing with insecurity in relationships or at work, whatever you need. Especially at a time like this, no one should be anxious about admitting that they're going through normal human struggles, because you deserve to be happy. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. And you don't even have to see anyone on camera if you don't feel comfortable doing so. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Join the millions of people who are seeing what therapy is really about. And Quillette Podcast listeners get 10% off their first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash Quillette. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Quillette. Thanks to BetterHelp for their sponsorship. And now back to the Quillette podcast. Ted Wheeler won. He seems now, after just an abysmal last year, he seems to be getting a little, Michael, have you noticed he's getting a little angrier? Yeah, uh, oh, yeah. He's a lot angry. He's actually been yeah. angrier since his apartment building was attacked in the middle of the night. So on At, fire. But he moved out. I mean, this is the thing. He did. It's like, who are, are, are you the mayor? Like, aren't you the guy that's supposed to be you know, saying what goes on here. Um, but yeah, he moved out. But yeah, he's angry and he, and he, and he recently said he wanted to uh, give the police, I don't remember for what area, $2 million, which is, you know, <laughs> it hasn't been popular. All they want to do is take money from the police. The activists want to defund the police, but the average citizen in Portland, I don't think does. No, not I at mean, all. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what the 
actual public opinion breakdown on this is. But Ted Wheeler did win re-election, even though his approval rating was like 20-some percent. Okay, and, the, and he won re-election because Sarah Ianna Rohn was his opponent. There was a whole bunch of people, myself included, who did not want to vote for Ted Wheeler, who did, because the alternative was it was deranged. Yeah. And I didn't do my own public opinion survey in Portland, but I did live there during all this. And I talked to a lot of my neighbors out in the street and I did not find a single solitary human being who liked what was going on downtown. Not one. Obviously, Nancy, you must have met people who did because you were down there covering it. So I'm sure you ran into plenty of people who thought it was all awesome. But just in a regular neighborhood, talking to people who randomly happened to live near me, the support for what was going on downtown was 0.0 percent. Well, I obviously, you know, the people that were down there doing it, they clearly wanted it to be happening and were right. perpetrating it. But I, I talked to lots and lots of people, um, especially around that neighborhood in, in North Portland, Kenton, because the Kenton Business District, of course, it was hit terribly hard by COVID. And it's a small little like three block long business district. And the shop owners with their own money, they created like outdoor dining and they, they closed off the street. They made it a walking street only for two blocks and they, they painted the streets, they, they kind of prettied it up and it looked really nice. Well, <laughs> the police union, which is one of the, you know, the the perennial targets, was a f- only a few blocks away. And, you know, they're setting fire to it again and again and breaking stuff and blah, blah, blah. And the, finally, the police come out and are giving chase and they run through the lit. The Kenton Business District had literally been open for two days. They run through, they break up the tables and set them on fire. Now, the next night, they do it again. Like, shopkeepers are standing in front of their stores. Like, do not do not bust up this store. Anyway, I interviewed a bunch of people, including people, not just the shopkeepers, one of whom is in my, my article, Terrence, people that lived in the neighborhood. And some of them were like what you were saying, Michael. They're like, they didn't support this. However, a lot of their neighbors did. They're like, you know what? These kids, yay for these kids. You know, I remember like when I was in college, my activist days, or even if they're not saying that, maybe they were wishing they had activist days or whatever it was. And in the, what's that uh, online neighborhood kind of thing where neighbors can talk to each other. Next door, next door. I was sent a whole bunch of threads by different people who were like, guys, like, I don't really want my neighborhood being busted up. And you should have seen the hate that this one guy got. Mm. What are you talking about? Are you, are you saying you support the police? But that's crazy. And There's I also think, people on the internet. Let's let's keep that in yeah, mind. But I do no, but think, next door is locally rooted. And so that's why I'm so stunned by what Nancy's saying, that people are actually defending. I think it's, I think there are three things. One is, you know, there are some people kind of believe in this kind of stuff, right? They're, they just, they feel that, you know, the youth is going to save us with their, and if it takes a little violence, well, okay. Who knows why? That's one reason. Number two, people are afraid. They are afraid to have these people coming up to their doorsteps. Yeah. Uh, And then there's also like, God, I cannot tell you the number of people. And we see this constantly. We see it in media. We see it. You know, it's like, well, look, are you saying you're like for the police? Are you saying you're for police brutality? Are you saying that you're pro-Trump? And this guy I'm talking is like, no, I'm just saying I don't want my neighborhood busted up. And it's like, well, you know what? You're part of the problem. And I, I, it's crazy. I mean, this is absolutely... Now that Trump's gone, one thing that's depressing about Michael's article is after Biden won the election, uh, Biden gets sworn in, quoting here from the article, anarchists unfurled a banner that looked like something Hezbollah would create, featuring an AK-47, always a good sign, beneath the words, we don't want Biden, we want revenge, exclamation mark. And another said, we're ungovernable. But like, if you're ungovernable, then how do you even begin to address that constituency? I mean, if they're demanding... You can't. It's insane. You can't. Look, these people don't vote. They're never going to get their way in a democratic society. And they, they very well know that. And so they're resorting to violence because but, it's what they have. But where do I mean, they look, live? There's all kinds of police like, reform going on inside the state of Oregon, and there has been since June of last year. And these people are acting as if that's not going on because it's not even what they want. They're not even interested in police reform. They want to abolish the police and abolish prisons. I mean, so they're, they are demanding the impossible, and they're demanding it violently. <laughs> people can buy his book. I'm talking about Andy Ngo, who's done a lot of reporting. He's a controversial figure. He got beaten up by Antifa. If you look on Andy Ngo's Twitter feed, he will show you photos of Antifa people who are arrested. And, and the photos look like just stereotypes of seventh year gender study students who have no, no, but like just no responsibilities. It's a, it's a stereotype 
They must have something in life that needs protecting. Do they have nothing in life that well, they regard as they want to protect it under the current system? I have a ton of things to say about this. First of all, Andy No, uh, who I know, you know, he I, I'm sure he does pick the more choice shots because you know Andy No has become like public enemy number one to them. Andy has an incredible news nose, but the fight that he's fighting is just uh he's gonna do that that kind of posting. Number two, who are these people and do they have anything to lose? Well, most are pretty young and they come from all across the board. I mean you've got like the rich Patrician Reedies like that opened my article like they l- literally looked like they could have been a cotillion had they been you know dressed not in black head to toe and sorry when you say Reedies you're talking Reed, Reed College, college? Oh, which, that's right I'm sorry about sorry that. no but that's good but that's kind of like I don't know the Smith College of Portland right? yes okay. it's it's a very 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 progressive liberal very very expensive uh, beautiful campus and then you've got general sort of progressive young people you also have a contingent of people that i mean a lot of them were kind of living in the park across from the federal building when that was going on you know for a few months but most of them are very young and to answer your question no they don't they don't have things to lose right but also when was all of this happening john it was happening during covid right so people were not in school right? Schools were closed. People, a lot of jobs had gone away, right? Your young people work in the service industry. So no, they don't have a job. Maybe they were getting unemployment. I know a lot of them were. And they are not supposed to go outside. And the bars aren't open. And the movies aren't open. And there's no concerts. Well, but I can go outside and mess stuff up and hang out with my friends and create a better world in, in air quotes. So they they didn't care if they were destroying but there stuff. are why, other why options would they care? there's other options there's disc golf for instance i like to go hiking it's, there you, you know, go hiking is, hiking is open it has become an identity it is an identity but it sounds like it there's a cynical aspect to that hotheads on social media know the accounts in portland that they can use to stir things something happens and fox has already got a crew in portland so they're performing for people at this point. i mean is there oh. a performative aspect hundred percent. Oh my goodness, a hundred percent. There's the outfits and, and it's when they're going to meet. Now you have to understand these are young people and they have a lot of energy and a lot of them are actually pretty creative. You kind of wish that they would apply it to something that was building, but I don't think that they know how to do that yet. I want to focus before I let both of you go on an issue that you agree on a lot, but I think there's one issue you might disagree on. And that Nancy, in your article and then in the podcast that we did on it, Um, We talked about the media situation in Portland. And one of the things we discussed is that traditional mainstream media is dying, and it's dying especially in medium-sized cities. And so a lot of the media consumption devolves to social media and to maybe some of these alt-weekly type things, which are kind of politically radicalized. We talked about that, and we talked about how it led to your situation where you and your husband and your business were unfairly targeted, sort of social justice mobbing. And yet Michael... There was a brief mention in your article, you suggested kind of the opposite, that you thought the local media actually has been doing a good job. I was comparing the local media to the national media. And the local media lives here and they know what's going on. And they know who the players are. And they were there was a lot more of the who, what, when, where and how in local journalism than there was in national media, where in national media, uh, most of what I read was purely ideologically driven on both the left and the right. And there was just there was less nuts and bolts just reporting of what was happening. And there was also the the national media just has less context and they don't know the place. And I understand how that works because I was a foreign correspondent. I was a reporter from all over the world. And so I would land in a place like Cairo. It's like, I don't know Cairo. It's difficult to write about a place that's strange to you. And so I did think that the local journalists did a better job. But I also, I was not covering this as a journalist the way Nancy was. So if Nancy has criticisms of what local journalists were doing, I will absolutely defer to her because she was in the mix in ways that I was not. The alt-weeklies in in Portland are actually pretty staunch. I mean, obviously, financially, everybody's in a hole. But, you know, you do have you have uh, four papers. You've got the Portland Tribune, which is pretty, pretty centrist. The Oregonian that used to be more conservative. Now, the coverage that they had of the protests pretty much leaned sympathetic, but not always. They, they've changed, too. They're, they're running some pretty good pieces there. Well, Lamet Week was pretty deep in the pocket for the protesters to the point where there was like a glamour shot of one Antifa gallop. But they're coming around a little bit, too. The Portland Mercury is so deep 
in with pro activist stuff to the point where they would they put my photo online so like avoid her she's a they're also big about you know don't take any pictures you can't take any pictures like you have to protect the activists i also got which was just shocking to me there's a big local guy that do it does a lot of reporting there and he wrote to me and he said you're going to get our side in trouble, something like that. And it's also a revolution by cell phone. I wrote a piece for Reason about that called You're, You're Not Allowed to Film. It was the most popular. I wrote 14 dispatches for them. It was by far the most popular. And, but, and yet, if you look at the protesters themselves, they spend half their time taking pictures of each other. That's right. Like, That's right. And they, and they take pictures of you. The last time I was there, the day after Biden was elected, I was, I'm standing in giant piles of broken glass. And they recognized me. I have pink hair. I'm kind of easy to spot. And five of them surrounded me in a little circle, and they all had their cameras on me going like, Oh, are you? You're what you I knew they sounded like that. I knew they sounded like that. They do. They're like 130 pounds soaking wet. And they were just like trying to taunt me and trying to be snotty. And it was so boring. And then this guy, he sees me and he's like, Oh, hey, Nancy, you're here for a reason. And he's a reporter, Shane Kavanaugh, for the Oregonian. And there's like, two real reporters here now and they, they all just oh, they just shrank away it's just <laughs> were these people activists or i shouldn't say activists or were they the media well you know, that's the big thing right you put it you put a piece of paper i mean michael have you ever walked around with a sign on your body that said media or press no i i haven't and i've been a journalist for 25 years because you asked john you asked is it sort of role playing Oh my God, is it role playing? You you put press on or you put medic on or you put viewer or on your body. And now you, it's- that It, it sounds like they have this whole sort of dress up cosplay insurgent force. I could make fun of these people all day. Although it is important, by the way, and Michael, you did a good job of saying this, that at least early on, there was a, a legitimate distinction between protesters who would come out during the day and then- people who are just kind of wanted to break windows and cause trouble at yeah, night. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and, 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 and we should recognize that distinction. And it, and it sounds like the vast Absolutely. majority of people were yeah, legitimate because, protesters. I mean, yeah, none of my none of my complaints are about people who are protesting normally. Like, whether I agree with protesters or not is immaterial. Right. Like, we have the right to free speech and freedom of assembly and all that in a, in a democratic society. So people have the right to protest whatever they want. But, you know, pro- smashing windows and setting fires is not protesting. It's criminal behavior. I mean, they're so radically, utterly, completely different. And now a message from another podcast, The Jordan Harbinger Show. If you're like me, you like to shake up your podcast repertoire every now and again. In the run-up to the U.S. election, I was listening to a lot of political stuff. But now I'm looking for something new. And there's a reason Jordan Harbinger's podcast caught my eye and was named a top podcast by Apple in 2018. It's because Harbinger, a Wall Street lawyer turned podcaster, focuses on real human beings and real human issues. Recent episodes have brought listeners issues like should a cheater get a second chance and how to protect yourself from psychopaths. And I dare you not to listen to another episode called Saying Sayonara to Sisters Swindling Sweetie. If this sounds interesting to you, look up The Jordan Harbinger Show wherever you listen to podcasts. That's H-A-R-B like Bob, I-N-G-E-R. And now back to our Quillette podcast. Final question, Michael. You actually talked about how, at least as I understand it, Ironically, in the Pacific Northwest, you do have the seeds of rapprochement between left and right. You talk about the Pacific Northwest as a place, I'm going to quote here, where many Republicans smoke pot and plenty of Mm -hmm. Democrats shoot guns. And actually, in fact, some of these Antifa types uh, have been arrested for for gun-related crimes, including murder. But putting that aside, putting aside the extremists, can you get some of these pot-smoking Republicans and libertarian-minded leftists? Like, is there... Ten years from now, could this be a city where those people have figured out how to live together and it's actually a pretty good place to live again? Yeah, I would say yes, simply because it was like that more in the past than it is now. So, like, every everything that happens takes place in a moment in time. And all things pass and all things change. History moves on. It never stays still for very long. So, And we're in such a bad place right now that... Um, regression to the mean like (laughs) it should kick in at some point and we should like veer at least in the direction of 
it's a new normal. I mean, we're not going to, there's no rewind button. We're not going to go back to exactly how things were before because history doesn't work that way. But yeah, the left and the right have gotten along better here than in the past. And they had, just like everywhere else in the United States. And Nancy, can you ever imagine going back to Portland again? I won't go back to Portland again. Totally frank. I, I, when I got to Portland, it felt small to me. And I was a little, a little hinky about that. But, you know, we built a life. My daughter went to high school. My husband built a business. But even before the whole thing started going down with my husband's business, I was already becoming bicoastal. I was already coming back to New York. And I was planning to spend like six months a year in Portland and six months a year in um, in New York. But I can't really do the work I want to do in Portland, not only because there's no real media scene there, but because people don't want the kind of news telling that I that I write. And also, like, I like big cities. I'm, I'll just go back to report right now. That's it. Uh, I'm not going to go back either. Well, you're close. I mean, you're... I, I am close, but the place where I am now, it is very close. And it's still technically part of the metro area, but it's a completely different place. And it feels different, and it's much smaller, and I'm not used to that yet. And it feels it, weird to me, well, but I'll get over it. You, it sounds like you wrote in your article you can hear coyotes at night, which can be a little unsettling, but it's better than hearing broken windows at night. Totally. Yeah. you got to pick your yeah. poison. Nancy Rommelman and Michael Totten, thank you so much for being on the Quillette Podcast. Thanks for having Thanks, me. Thanks, John. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Quillette Podcast. Quillette is where free thought lives. We are an independent, grassroots platform for heterodox ideas and fearless commentary. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by going to quillette.com and becoming a paid subscriber. This subscription will also give you access to all our articles and early access to Quillette social events. 